All right, everyone. So if there are any further questions, uh, please feel free to enter them into the chat. Otherwise, uh, we can actually, I think, move on to our uh, ne next presentation. And that will be featuring um, uh, three presenters. Uh, and so we're going to move over into the open footprint demo of the reference imp implementation. And that's going to be covering how to install and configure, how to access, how to use, and the plan for 2021. Uh, we will uh, have the moderator, which will be Sammy, and then our two presenters, which will be taking you through the demo, are um, Boopy. I, I like to say Boopy. It's Bupinder Singh Shala is a program manager at Emphasis and is also leading the Open uh, Footprint UI development project. He's based out of Mysore, India, and Boopy leads digital transformation programs for the oil and gas uh, majors. Gert William um, Hashes is account CTO at IBM with his technical leadership and expertise in oil and gas and new engines energies, he has created open hybrid cloud architecture to build sustainability platforms that have enduring impact to the client's reimagined new normal. And Garrett has an open group distinguished IT architect certificate in defining architecture and holds a MS degree in electrical engineer from the University of Twent in the Netherlands. So without further ado, I will turn it to all of you, Sammy, if you want to um, uh, start, then uh, I'll, I'll close down. Thanks. All righty. Perfect. Thanks, Heidi. Appreciate it. And Gareth Willem and, and Boopy, uh, you know, thanks for joining today and, and uh, we'll queue you, queue you guys up here. So, and Boopy, I think you should have the ability to share your screen at the time at the appropriate time, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll test out the fun of WebEx. Okay, good. All right. Um, so thanks uh, everybody for joining again. Uh, we've got a, a, a good discussion, I think today around the reference implementation. Um, We'll walk you through a little bit of an introduction around what is this um, talk, and then actually get quickly over to a demonstration um, and then we'll talk about next steps and QA. Um, I'll tee up the conversation today. I mean, I think as we talked about, um, you know, yesterday, you know, if you go back to sort of what are we trying to accomplish and what is it that we're trying to do? We're really, you know, trying to calculate or, you know, the, the carbon footprint. We're trying to make that easier. We're trying to share information. We're trying to visualize data. And we're trying to report information to stakeholders. Appreciate there might be multiple systems out there. There might be multiple technologies, a whole bunch of spreadsheets, I would imagine, that have all this. Um, but as we talked about yesterday, there's there's a bit of a reference architecture that we've got and, and, and an ability to, to share Sammy, data. Sammy, sorry, it's John. Um, hate to cut in here, but unless you retain presenter, if you move the slides, nobody will else Nobody will see them moving unless you're the presenter. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. You have to retain present. I, I will make you presenter again. Bear with oh, me. Okay. But if you move the slides, you'll see them moving on your screen, but nobody else will see them moving unless you're the presenter. Okay. Ah, okay. Perfect. Thanks. So, Thanks for the clarification, to, John. Yeah. When you're ready to hand over to Boopy, you hand over then. Okay. But not until that point. Okay. All righty. Thanks, John. Appreciate right. it. Uh, good. good, good, good. Can everybody see the agenda slide now? Yes. yes, thank you. You guys are like, what the heck is he talking about? Okay, good. All right. So these were my, my four graphics from earlier around calculating the carbon footprint and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm glad you guys told me that, uh, that John, for inter interjecting because uh, I think the, the rest of the story have been very confusing if you couldn't see my screen. So excellent. All right. So these are the objectives that we're trying to accomplish. What I want to do is maybe hand this over to now to, to Garrett Willem. Uh, who walk us through how is this architecture influencing and then let's talk let's maybe go through a real live example I think so Garrett Willem if I can turn it over to yourself well thank you uh, Sammy yeah absolutely um, so I'm here from Hash is um, working in the minimal viable product team and what we have done here and that's also the picture that you see on the slide right now is 
building an architecture, very simple architecture, basically, to start the MVP. So we uh, thought it would started with this with a, with, a, with a simple version of um, you know the architecture that will be on the roadmap later on. But you know we thought let's start simple and but let's start uh, fast in that way. What is important to mention here and before we go into demonstration that the architecture is completely um, on open architecture. So so it is an open architecture that helps us as the whole community under the open group in the open footprint forum to co-develop for this important sustainability use cases and uh, carbon footprint. And I will go uh, in, in a minute in, in, in the different layers that we have laid down, um, but it's important to, to notice that, um, that the architecture is really, it should be really inviting almost for uh, all the innovation that's, um, that we would like to do within this important uh, community. And to illustrate that, on the left hand side, you see a couple of concentric circles, right? And this illustrates just an illustration of what type of um, users you could have for the open uh, data platform, for the, uh, for the open footprint uh, data platform. So you could think of, you know, large companies that have to capture their data uh, in a consistent way for, uh, for carbon footprint. Um, but there are also um, use cases for uh, governing bodies, for certifying agencies, or maybe uh, other uh, stakeholders there that are going to use the platform to um, report things, see uh, in insights from dashboards, etc. A very important group of stakeholders there as well. And then the outer circle, you see uh, all sorts of other things like uh, even electrical vehicles, uh, really like, you know, smaller agents that will make use of uh, this data platform as well, even natural persons or households. Now, why is that important? Because that gives and provides the context for the architecture um, and therefore it needs to be fully scalable to the different uh, scales that uh, the, the, the platform uh, needs to, uh, to work for. On the right hand side is a couple of layers and it's a really a simplified version of a more complex versions that we have seen before and also probably during this uh, the two days and also maybe some other uh, open footprints uh, meetings that you have attended um, in the, on the, so i'm looking now at the right hand side where you see a green box right open footprint data platform that's basically the platform that we are working on different layers simplified version again but what is super important is the layer of um, standardized APIs. The standardized APIs will expose the functions of the platform to the whole ecosystem of developers, users of the open platform. And these APIs are, you know, besides there are standards, they will also be uh, exposed uh, via the platform and they provide and realize the functions of the system, data services, but also um, other services that will uh, provide you data lineage and all the things that we have been talking about during these two days. And of course, there are some ingression services as well to get the data in, right? This whole green box is running on what we call a data control pane. So this data control pane is really a, 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 almost like an, uh, like an uh, think of, an, of, of one control plane to manage and, uh, your data, govern your data, segment your data, et cetera. And security is of course super important as well if you are ending up with a multi-tenant uh, 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 platform as well later on. Not now, eh? don't get me wrong, not now, but later on. That's all, all the architecture should really envision that. And then of course, this, uh, this, this stack needs to run on, on infrastructure services. Well, think of cloud, think of the, the cloud hyperscalers that we have where the infrastructure will be completely embedded. So just as an, as, an, as an starting point for the conversation, what we are going to show you in a minute, the demonstration of uh, you know, the first minimal viable products. But if we can go to the next slide, or should I do it myself, uh, Sammy? I don't know if you can switch to the next slide or I don't have a button here. Sammy, so, you have control. Thank you. Ah, thank you so much. The objective of today is to show you um, really the carbon life cycle of a product. So we took a product and I'll come back into that in a minute. We took a very uh, specific product that we all know. And we are going to show you how that life cycle end to end could be supported by the data platform and how we have uh, been doing that with our demonstration with our MVP, with our minimal viable products. And that's then the, the second objective, of course, is to try, really try to understand 
how the capabilities of the current MVP can support, let's say, this very simple use cases now, uh, but also, you know, what could be an inspiration for the future and a roadmap uh, in the future. So let's go to our story. Thank you. So our story is a very um, concrete story. Uh, we are going to talk about a very simple product that everyone probably knows, pretty sure that everyone knows. It's a bat. It's a bat. So this story is a day in the life of a bat, of course, with a wink here. And think of the bats that you buy at this you know, large company where, um, where you have companies in the world that have, you know, really do it yourself bats, right? They are pre-produced, but you still have to do work, do some work on, on it yourself to um, use uh, screwdrivers, planks, and, and, and put all the bed together at home. So this type of bed we have imagined here. Um, and as you know, there is quite an, quite an effort uh, and a, quite an, an, a string of actions uh, that has happened before you have that bed finally in your bedroom and you can, when you can use it. And we have simplified our story here because, you know, this is a super complex end to end process, but we have simplified it here. And our story starts really at the beginning where the bed already has been produced. And we know that there is a whole story before that for producing, let's say, the planks, the, the sheets, the mattresses, everything. But here we simplify the story. There is a company, Acme, imaginary company, Acme producing has produced a bed and the end result is that they have boxes a couple of boxes that will be used um, that will you know ultimately are the ingredients for this uh, fantastic bed and what the thing is that um, so once it has been produced uh, near the global manufacturing sites of this uh, acme company um, those global manufacturing sites normally would have warehouses or so real hardware warehouses from where the shipment starts of these um, uh, components of the bed to the different markets, either in Europe, US, Australia, Indonesia, imagine the whole is a global company. And for that, you really need, um, you know, transportation, quite a string of transportation, as a matter of fact to bring the product from the manufacturing site warehouses uh, by using vehicles going to for example a harbor where um, the harbor uh, material uh, uh, equipment uh, uh, handles the 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 pieces of the bed into you know vessels the vessels go to a certain area of the world where the goods are unloaded into cars or trains or whatever, you can imagine there is a whole string of transportation to be done there. But we also would like to address here that in the meantime, our main character, Mary, is going to be very inspired by, you know, a new bet. And she is starting to look into catalogs, go to websites of Acme. Um, maybe she is going to do some uh, visits to the store already. This whole thing of inspiring and the sell selling process is, of course, an important step here as well. We have to consider that if we want to have an end to end picture of the carbon footprint of this, you know, very simple product like a, like a bed. And imagine then at a certain good day when Mary going, is going to pick up her bed, she has decided what bed she wants, she, she would like to have, goes to the store, clicks on a couple of things, and then she needs to pick up all the ingredients from the distribution uh, area of this store. You probably know how that feels, right? A bit confusing, loading your stuff on a, on a small uh, cart and then finally drive the bed to home and fix it. The last uh, aspect that we would like to show here is that, you know, from a totally different angle, for example, you know, customer success managers of, uh, of this company uh, for example, uh, Dan needs to be able to really look at what is the carbon intensity of this product. So Dan needs reports, dashboards, uh, complete understanding of what the footprint is of this very specific product, the bed. So in other words, we have created here a really a day in a life, probably a bit more than a day, but you know, figuratively speaking, a day in the life of a bed that shows basically all the aspects of uh, of what it would take to capture 
all the data, the carbon data in a consistent way by making use of the open footprint uh, platform. So let's go to the next slides. Real quick, uh, because uh, we'll see everything in action in a minute. So what you will see is, uh, first of all, as we've mentioned, when the story starts, when you have this bet, Acme company has produced a bet. We first have to set up the system, right? We first have to uh, define the organization of Acme, the different uh, facilities that they have, the processes that they use to produce the bet, the, um, um, also, you know, the, the, the scope and uh, the, 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 the scope of what you are going to, um, uh, account for that will be super important as well. Everything you will see from the data model that Gomar has uh, shown on the, on the first day yesterday, uh, uh will be uh, here as well when it all starts. Can you go to the next slide, please? And then it all starts with, um. You know, if we just dive into, for example, transportation and the different steps in the transportation, how our uh, uh, platform will be able to support the capturing of the diff of the of the of the greenhouse gas emissions of all the steps that are part of this end-to-end -end process. That's also something we're going to show. Please go to the next slide. Thank you. And then also, what is important here is that as we have been talking about, let's say, also other steps like inspire and sell and a digital footprint that this product can have as well. We need to have a uh, dashboard in the future that will really show and, and capture all the aspects of, uh, of, of, uh, of producing things like a bet. So that will be, uh, be uh, discussed as well. So far, so good. This is only the theory. Let's go into practice and let's see how this all is done in a live demonstration. So I hand it over to you, uh, Bupi. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Bupi, Program Manager Infosys. And I'll quickly walk you through the screens for the OFP reference UI that we have developed. So as we discussed in yesterday's architecture session as well, this is just a reference UI. So it comes as part of the whole platform bundle that you'll install on your organization infrastructure. So as a reference point, and you are obviously free to develop your own applications as you move forward, as long as the basic data platform and the API is exposed are being utilized. So this is completely open source following the open group practices. The right from the login page that you see right now, it's uh, developed through Key Cloak, which is our open ID based identity provider. So that's the identity provider that we have used. So like a normal UI, you provide your user ID password and you hit the sign in button. If you are an authorized user, it will take you to the home page of the application. So if I move to the next page. Right, so that's the home page of the application. In the interest of time, I'm just showing you quick snapshots and to avoid the typographical errors in the use case that we talked about. So this is the home page of the application. Very simple UI that we have built to just ensuring that we keep it simple. The bottom tiles that you see here are just informational tiles and the real navigation happens through the top navigation bar. And the way we have categorized these modules is a typical workflow that anybody will follow when they are trying to enter their data and generate the reports out of it. So I'll just quickly tell you about those modules. So the first one is inventory boundary. That's where you set up your organization, your organization structure, the boundary data, what are the GHG sources and so on and so forth. Once you do all that configuration, you come to start entering this data, which is through the emission data module. And once you have entered all your emission data, you start reporting out of it. So we have kept very simple reports in this application. And I believe there are already project that is running around to develop more sophisticated visualizations on top of the same platform. So just to keep simple, we have simple tabular reports built in the in this application itself and which you can again enhance using whichever visualization tool you use in your organization. The last module that you see is admin module where we can enter the reference data. So all the drop down lists or lookups that we have used in this application, you can manage all that data through admin. All right, I'll move forward. So the use case that we have picked up uh, which Gert just explained right now uh, a day in a life of a bed. 
so let's say I am the Acme company organization admin who is actually set up this tool for the first time. So normally I'll I'll download the platform. I'll put it into my organization infrastructure. The the platform gives me this reference UI. I launch the UI. The first thing I have to do is set up my organization structure. Why? Because that's how you will actually eventually report your data as well. Let's say you want to report at an organization level or sub organization level or a particular facility. So and it could be it could be simpler organization. It could be much more complex organization with a lot of hierarchy levels in your organization. So the tool is flexible enough to cater to those levels and even the simplest one. So in this example that you see Acme organization, it's a corporate level, which is the topmost level. And the industry sector it belongs to is pulp and paper. It's a Acme wooden works and then we can add a registration number, a dance number or a registration number for your organization, which ultimately you will actually use in your emission report. When you are publicly publishing your reports, you include some basic details, including your registration number and so on and so forth. Your your organization address, your contact details, all key people that you want to include. So this is your basic corporate or topmost level setup of the organization. Then we move on to the next levels of your organization, starting with sub organization. So like let's say in our example, the Acme company has one unit for manufacturing and another unit for distribution or transporting the actual bid to its end user or the customer. So I have added Acme manufacturer as a sub organization. It's a subsidiary. Again, same industry. So you have a flexibility of adding the industry at the at the sub organization level as well. And then similar fields. Your address and, and contact details for the sub organization. Similarly, a distributor as another sub organization. Here, here you can see the sector is actually service or an office based organization, which is just a distribution center for Acme company. So that's how you will set up your subsidiaries and your corporate level. Then comes the business area. So in which regional area you are actually doing your business. If you want to report your emissions based on that, you can form that structure here. So you can see we have Asia Pacific as one of the region and Europe as another business area. So after that we have. The, the facility. So if you want to report your data, you want to track at the facility level your actual offices. You can do that as well. You can set up your facilities. So in our use case, we have Acme China and Acme Holland. China is the actual manufacturing unit and Holland is where the distribution happens. So that's how you'll completely form your organization structure before you start entering the data. The next level of configuration that you do is the boundary setup, which is kind of the heart of the application where you define the GHG sources at the organization level, sub organization level or at the facility level. So these are these are the steps involved in the in the boundary setup, which is organization boundary. GHG sources, facility level GHG sources and the sector attributes. So as you saw during the organization setup, we can choose a, a sector for your organization and sub organization. So similarly catering to different different sectors, we have this sector attribute because every every industry will have some very specific way in which they report the data or because of the manufacturing processes and so on and so forth. There will always be some sector specific attributes which can be included here. And that's where the flexibility of the platform comes into picture. All right. So step number one, organization boundary. I've selected Acme China. Financial control, yes. Operational control as yes. Similarly, for Holland, we provide the, the equity share between between your different sub organizations. And then you move on to add the GHG sources. So in this particular example, as I said, Acme China is where the manufacturing is happening. So we have scope one emission. The GHG category as the emissions imported energy. So what electricity you are consuming from that unit? That's as one of the GHG sources. Similarly, on the distribution center for Acme, we have 
the electricity consumption in there as well. So similarly, you can add the other facility level GHG sources. Then comes the, the sector attributes, the, the flexibility that I was talking about that you can define your own your own parameters. So for, for the group transportation, I have added these two parameters that customer commute or uh, our fictional customer Mary actually travels or, or takes her car and travels to the distribution center. And from there, she she normally tries to interact with the salesperson or tries to choose her her bed. And then finally that bed gets transported using the company transport. So those are sector specific attributes which can be added. Similarly, these can be added for for shipping industry, for cement industry, and so on and so forth. All right. So then comes the the entry of the emissions data. That's our emission data module. So till now we have seen how I set up my organization boundary. Then how do I define my my GHG sources at facility at sub organization level? So after doing all that, I come and start entering the data at at organization level, sub organization level, and so on and so forth. So in our example, electricity consumption is one of the GHG source. So we are generating or we are entering data for Jan March quarter, January to March. What was the, the amount of energy consumed and what was the type of the material? So whether it's CO2, NO2 and so on and so forth. What was the method type? Whether we were actually able to measure this or it's a, it's a calculated value like we just heard about the calculation engine part. That's what will drive that kind of calculation. And you put the emission data and the unit of measure. So the number of GHG sources you have, these panels will repeat for that. You will enter the data and it and this is again a reference UI if you want to import from your existing databases or something that obviously is an extensible architecture that we have in place. If you don't want to do the data entry from this UI or you want to build your own UI, the architecture is flexible enough to support all that. Okay. So that's on the emissions data entry. So once you have added all your data, we saw for one unit and this is for the second sub organization that we have. So similar calculation again for the electricity consumption group. Jan March quarter. What is my overall calculated or the emissions quantity? So that's for the ECME distributors. Moving on to the. The simple report that we were talking about, including the, the sector attributes. So first part in the emissions data was the GHG sources and the flexibility which I was talking about that you can enter parameters specific to your industry. So for Acme distributors in our example, we have the customer compute and the company transport as the specific parameters for which you can enter the unit of measure and value. So that's how you report or enter the data for the sector specific attributes. Moving on to the simple reports which I talked about. So you can create reports for a particular period. Let's say the one particular quarter or start date or end date based on how frequently you report this data. So ideally whatever data you have entered through the platform, you should be able to generate a report out of it. That's the idea. And as I said, we want to keep it simple. You can enter as create as many simple reports here. And for this particular quarter, this is a sample report. So for the ECME example that we have for ECME China facility, I have this much emissions. And for ECME Holland, these are the calculations or the emissions. So this is obviously simple tabular report, but you can create your dashboards. As I said, we are already working on the visualization project. How this data can be visualized in future. So you can have as many charts or as many dashboards like what you see right now. All right, I think that's about it from my side. So over to you, Gert and Sammy. Yeah, you know, and Boopy, thank you for that. I think it's it's it, it, sort of a, a useful representation. And I think a couple of things that I want to to kind of leave with as we as we get closer towards the end, and and also potentially open it up for some questions as well. And I see some questions already in the in the chat window here. Um, I mean, I think so. Two things. So one is 
you know, if you if you think about the story that Garrett Willem, you know, described, right, everything from sort of that manufacturing of that bed to the distribution to the transport, you know, to 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 the customer buying, et cetera. I mean, if you think about what we're trying to do, once again, is sort of represent that emissions across the supply chain, right? Um, look at it across different organizations, different umbrellas, different lenses, and so on and so forth. Um, in some cases, we may need to be able to share that information across organizations. In, in our simplistic example, everything was sort of owned by Acme. In reality, that's probably not likely the case. There might be a shipping company. There might be a supply chain company that's that's actually making the beds and so on and so forth. You could imagine that this is extended supply chain that are then doing their own calculations or their, their own emissions and being able to share that information across so that you have a complete information uh, or a complete representation of your impacts. And then finally, to be able to, to visualize that, whether it's by the company or by the customer or whoever it might be. Okay, a couple of key things I wanna kind of point out and, and I wanna emphasize once again, um, you know, one is this 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 concept of of, of open architecture, right? It's, it is, it's a reference architecture that's, that's available for use. Now, and as Bupi mentioned, you know, there are folks that might type that in or calculate the emissions as we saw from William and Javier earlier. You might already have existing systems like your SAP or your Sphera systems or whatever it might be that are calculating emissions, you know, importing that data in. I see a question from Raymond on the on the Q&A around, you know, potential uses of blockchain. Absolutely, right? All those, those different channels of getting data into the system are all feasible. But at the end of the day, we have a common reference architecture and a common data model that we're all working so that as different organizations, as different ecosystems, um, partners, and so on and so forth, and as different technology providers, you know, bring their technology, we've got a common way of, of sharing and communicating and, 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 and storing and processing that information and equally so visualizing it. So something to consider as we go through this. Keep in mind, this is MVP, so deliberately so, we wanted to start somewhere. I'm sure there's lots of things that we can and should be doing. Equally, there's probably some areas that, you know, vendors and software partners and technology providers have already are in this space, and we just need to align into their, into the, the into the open architecture. Okay. Garrett Villam, anything I'm missing on the, on this, on this uh, diagram that we wanted to cover? No, you, you made a very good summary, I believe, for Semi. Uh... Um, it, it, it is it is still, you know, let, I hope this will be a bit of an inspiration of what can be done with with the platform and it is really early stage. Um, um, but you have to start somewhere, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, the, the point being is, you know, once again, I kind of go back to these green boxes that I see being able to represent those emissions, you know, whether that's being inputted, whether that's being imported, whether that's being integrated from systems and blockchains and so on and so forth, and then being able to share. The other important thing about the reference architecture and part of what we're showing is ideally this reference architecture exists in multiple you know, instances, multiple organizations, and the ability to share information via through APIs and some of that reference architecture stuff that we've looked at yesterday and today makes it easier so that if you're the transport company, you might be quantifying your scope one emissions because of the ships and the boats, you're then able to communicate that to you know your customers and so on and so forth and down the road and down the road. Uh, I know Gomar yesterday talked about upstream versus downstream emissions, same kind of concept that we've got the ability to share that information. Okay. Good. All right. Um, a couple more slides and then I'll open it up for some so for some questions. Um, it, what's next for us? I mean, I think we're going to continue to validate the reference implementation against test data sets. We want to make sure that it's fit for purpose, that it accurately represents the footprint. Um, once again, there's organizations that have been tracking this, but now how do we make sure that it's a consistent way to, 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 to do that? Um, we definitely want to continue to, to look at the calculation engine, so embed that as William and Javier talked about earlier today. How do we then fit that into, the, into this architecture that we've seen in terms of the platform? Or alternatively, if organizations uh, are, are really going to be leveraging their own solutions, whether they built it or bought it, you know, to be able to, to facilitate that in. And then finally, last but not least, but really to, to look at that sort of that sharing of information through APIs and so on and so forth. So, so ideally, that's 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 sort of what's ahead of ahead of us in in the journey. We're still in that MVP state, so we still need to actually finish out this MVP and, and get that published so that people can download it, install it, play with it, and touch it, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but anyways, just maybe a, a, a good starting point. Okay. Good. I think that um, I do want to just kind of give a couple of credits because it, it's what you see. Although we Boopy covered that in in a very short period of time, in 15 minutes, it represents a lot of hard work by by Emphasis and Wipro and IBM and Shell who've contributed significantly to the development of that. Um, once again, it's 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 a starting point. You've got to start somewhere. I'm sure there's probably a thousand things that we can add to it. Uh, uh, and I know every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, wait, what about this? What about this? And, and we'll continue to evolve and grow that. Um, but the key thing is that we've got a common, um, you know, taxonomy, common ref data model and so on and so forth. Okay, good. All right. I think that's pretty much all I had to, for, for today. I know we've got a fair amount of time still left in, in the agenda. We've got about 15 minutes that we wanted to leave for any questions or, or comments. Um, we still have think, questions outstanding, uh, Sammy. Yeah, you see that? Huh? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I was just kind of scrolling through here. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Um, Jared Willem, do you want to maybe take the question around the the architecture one that I see from Mono, and then I'll maybe cover some of the other ones. Oh, or let me read it out. Maybe that so might be easier. Can you so. read it out because I was looking through the. Can you yeah. Read let it out? me. Yeah. Let me read it out. So, so the question from Mono is: How would this architecture prevent duplicate reporting? Uh, example, who should report? Example, a shipper or a receiver should report? Yeah. No. Um, um, so that, that is also, you know, the architecture itself can support it, but I think it will be important to uh, define the processes here as well. The boundaries of where you can, where you will uh, report on will be very important. The data model includes those boundaries. Um, the, the duplicates that can happen if you're receiving the product or if you're producing the product um, is, is supported by the data model, but you have to make sure that um, the dashboards that you're creating on top of the data model um, um, are really taking care of those boundaries as well. Um, I think the um, the the concept eh, that the concept of the different scopes and the, the concept of the upstream and a downstream model um, that 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 I'm referring to also what Homar was talking about uh, yesterday uh, facilitates that um, the implementation that we have right now um, is a first implementation of the data model but um, there is work to be done to um, to uh, support that further that's that's for sure so I think it's a very good question yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's spot on, Gar Willem. I mean, if you think about sort of the reporting, in some ways, it, it, you may consider duplicate reporting, but it's really more accurately representing your 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 impacts, your footprint from an organizational perspective. So, you might have a logistics company, a shipper, in our in our example here. I mean, they're generating emissions, right? Their ships have diesel, and they're you know burning, and and that's generating emissions, and that's part of their scope one emissions. Equally, that might be attributed to scope three, scope two, or scope three emissions for for other organizations. So, you know, things to consider that 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 in some ways it's it, it may be duplicative, but in in many ways it's representative of the entire scope. And that could also represent, for example, things like when you get into scope three, the emissions that are associated to your you know to to the products that you you know or goods and services that you that you're uh, you know that you're providing or selling, so to speak. So, hopefully, Mano answered your question. Um, Maybe a separate question, I think, um, that I see here um, from Shamuli. Um, are we going to have a master data validation and automation for scope one, two, three based on a mission type from operation source and the scope will be auto, auto determined? Um, uh, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll take a first pass of that one, Gert Willem, and, and happy yeah. to get your thoughts. And, and Johan, feel free to, to chime in as well. Uh, I, 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 I will say, Eventually, yes. Um, I don't necessarily know if everybody has their firm handle on, especially the scope threes. I think ones and twos are probably a little bit, probably more easier to find. Um, but I think once you get into scope three, that might be a little bit tricky uh, to start to auto determine. Um, that isn't that doesn't say that we can't start to to be able to track what are scope one, two, and three within the system and to be able to validate that. You know, getting to the automation. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely an achievable thing. You know, whether that's the highest priority for an organization versus just uh, the the sharing of information. That's that's probably something for us as a community to decide. Yeah, you're correct. I'm not to add to that, uh, Sammy. You spot on. Yeah. Good. 
Good. And then last, but uh, I, I just making sure I don't miss any questions here. Um, I think Raymond, I got I got yours already. Um, and Alice, just to come back to your question, uh, which is I, I think sort of a build up from from an, from the earlier presentation from from William around the calculation engine. So just to talk through that, and, and I think it's a couple of flavors. So first of all, the methodologies that we put into these calculations engines are generally certified. They're they're either ISO standards or they're regulatory driven. Um, so those are the engines that those are the calculations that you would embed um, and and then uh, ingrained um, or embed into the calculation engines or into whatever tool that you have. The calculation engine itself often is assured by a third party, you know, auditor verifier. Then those are those are certified people that do that. Um, we'll have to go back and investigate to see if there's, there's the calculation engines actually get officially certified by a standard or if that's through the verification process. I myself am not as familiar, but it's, I think it's a good, uh, it's a good takeaway for us to consider. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that people have comfort that the calculations that are being done are correct and are right and the methodologies that are being used. I think we can definitely ensure that the calculations and the factors that are being used in the open source are representative of of the you know the the standard calculations the endorsed calculations the regulatory ones whether that be EPA or you know UCOA or or you know IPCA or any of those different areas I think we'll also find that there's a lot of different interpretations of those regulations and so oftentimes even with carbon for example uh, you might have multiple uh, um, multiple methodologies that are both equally applicable as well so there's there's some complexity to it but it's a good point that's uh, that's taken well, also important over here uh, that we of course using metadata keep track of what calculations we use and how we use this calculation so people can always go back to later say okay this calculation was used this release and this way was used so the whole metadata story is also important to support uh, for future reference and, and and just to build on that too, Johan, as you, as you think about it, as, as you as sparked an idea in my head as well, or a comment in my head, is also some of these methodologies that are coming. We've, we've now seen advances in satellite imagery for methane data. The regulators themselves and the verifiers themselves are still catching up to those as well. So how, how sure are they? How certain are they? How do they align with the, the regulations? I think there was also a question on blockchain by Raymond. Yeah, we already, we already respond to that. Uh, maybe I give a, a general statement about blockchain because people often ask that. Over time, we will add blockchain and also Sammy mentioned that we will add blockchain to the mix. As I said yesterday, uh, at the moment we're still uh, crawling and I see blockchain being running. So blockchain will be important when you want to do a proof of origin. You really say that the values you put in are the real values so over time will we add blockchain to the to the platform yes we clearly will we will not have any meet today no will not will not have any meet today for the reason i just gave Good. other questions from the group one once nice making sure i didn't miss anything i think no ai I, I think uh, just to just to build on that, Raymond. I think uh, you know equally so. I think that's that's sort of in the run phase of versus the crawl. Um, equally, I think you know I think there there are um, once again I think technologies exist out there for for um, you know applying artificial intelligence into some of this. Some of these may be not as proprietary, or some of them may be proprietary to specific vendors that you know feed off the data from our platform. Alternatively, as more open source methodologies come into place, that could be something that we consider into the AI as well. I mean, equally, I think it's it's important to understand what are we using the AI for? I mean, once again, I go back to the, the key purpose of what we're trying to do is make sure we can effectively report and share information, especially across boundaries. Um, some organizations may, may elect to implement some of that AI at a much more operational level as well. So we'll, we'll have to assess that, but I think it's a good point as well uh, to see that. And also in the AI space is also, you know, is it really for prevention or is it to understand where we're seeing gaps, deficiencies and potential, um, you know, challenges to meeting var various carbon targets and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good point to, to bring in. Maybe, maybe to add to that, build on that, we Please. see 
yeah, if you, if, when we look at our architect we showed yesterday, the application space is not really part of, of the open footprint. It's really where people can shine, can differentiate, as, and again, provide solutions. AI, of course, is very much part of that space. So AI will exploit the data in our open footprint environment for the AI, for the API layer. But they, you, you also look at AI where, where companies want to differentiate, want to do something special. And therefore, a lot of the AI, not everything, there can also be AI in the data platform layer, but a lot of AI, um, whether machine learning, machine vision, other things, they really fall under that gray piece where we say that's outside the scope of the open footprint work. That's what they, people want to differentiate, want to shine, want to have their own property solutions. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. Anything else, I think? Any other last questions? If not, so Gerd Willem, Boopy, thank you so much. And uh, Heidi, if I can turn it back over to you. Absolutely, and thank you all. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Boopy. Thank you, Gatwell. Excellent, excellent session and overview of the demo. So.